Section 10 of The Carved Lions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Bodorf. The Carved Lions by Mary Louisa Molesworth. Chapter 10 Taking Refuge. For a minute or two, I seemed to feel nothing. Then there came over me a sort of shiver, partly of cold, for it was very cold, and partly of misery. I roused myself, however. With the remembrance of that other evening had come to me also the knowledge of where I was. Only a few doors down the sloping street on the left-hand side came a wide stretch of pavement, and there, in a kind of angle, stood a double door, open on both sides, leading into a small outer hall from which again another door, glazed at the top, was the entrance to Cranston's showrooms. I remember it all perfectly. Just beyond the inner entrance stood the two carved lions that Hattie and I admired so much. I wish I could see them again. And yes, a flash of joy went through me at the thought. I could get Mrs. Selwood's address quite as well from old Mr. Cranston as from the big grocer. As soon as the idea struck me, I hurried on seeming to gain fresh strength and energy. It was almost dark, but a gas lamp was burning dimly above the lintel, and inside, on the glass of the inner door, were the large gilt letters, Cranston and Company. I ran up the two or three broad, shallow steps and pushed open the door, which was a swing one. It was nearly time for closing, but that I did not know. There was no one to be seen inside, not, at least, in the first room, and the door made no noise. But there stood the dear lions. I could not see them very clearly, for the place was not brightly lighted. But I crept up to them, and stroked softly the one nearest me. They seemed like real friends. I had not courage to go into the other showroom, and all was so perfectly still that I could scarcely think any one was there. I thought I would wait a few minutes in hopes of someone coming out, of whom I could inquire if I could see Mr. Cranston and I was now beginning to feel so tired, so very tired and so cold. In here, though I did not see any fire, it felt ever so much warmer than outside. There was no chair or stool, but I found a seat for myself on the stand of the further and lion. Each of them had a heavy wooden stand. It seemed very comfortable, and I soon found that by moving on a little I could get a nice rest for my head against the lion's body. A strange, pleasant sense of protection and comfort came over me. How glad I am that I came in here, I said to myself. I don't mind if I have to wait a good while. It is so cozy and so warm. I no longer made any plans. I knew I wanted to ask for Mrs. Selwood's address, but that was all I thought of. What I should do when I had it, I did not know. Where I should go for the night, for now it was quite dark, I did not trouble about it all. I think I must have been very much in the condition I have heard described, of travelers lost in the snow. The overpowering wish to stay where I was and rest was all I was conscious of. I did not think of going to sleep. I did not know I was sleepy. And for some time I knew nothing. The next thing that caught my attention was a very low murmur, so low that it might have been merely a breath of air playing in the keyhole. I seemed to have been hearing it for some time before it took shape, as it were, and grew into a softly whispering voice, gradually gathering into words. Poor little girl, so she has come at last. Well, as you say, brother, we have been expecting her for a good while, have we not? Yes, indeed, but speak softly. It would be a pity to awake her, and what we have to do can be done just as well while she sleeps. I don't agree with you, said the first speaker. I should much prefer her being awake. She would enjoy the ride, and she is an intelligent child, and would profit by our conversation. As you like, replied number two. I must be off to fetch the boy. She will perhaps be awake by the time I return. And then, just as I was on the point of starting up and telling them I was awake, came a sound of stamping and rustling, and a sort of whirr and a breath of cold air which told me the swing door had been opened. And when I sat straight up and looked about me, lo and behold, there was only one lion to be seen, 
the stand of his brother was empty. I, please, I am awake, I said rather timidly. It was me you were talking about, wasn't it? I, it was I. The verb to be takes the same case before it as after it, was the reply, much to my surprise and rather to my disgust. Who would have thought that the carved lions bothered about grammar? It was I, then, I replied meekly. I did not want to give any offense to my new friend. Please. I heard you saying something. Something about going for a ride? And where has the... the other Mr. Lion gone? I heard about... a boy? You heard correctly, my lion replied, and I knew somehow that he was smiling, or whatever lions do that matches smiling. My brother has gone to fetch your brother. We planned it all some time ago. We shall meet on the seashore and travel together. But we should be starting. Can you climb up on my back? Oh, yes, I said calmly, as if there was nothing the least out of the common in all this. I'm sure I can. Catch hold of my mane, said the lion. Don't mind tugging. It won't hurt. And, not to my surprise, for nothing surprised me. I felt my hands full of soft, silky hair, as the lion shook down his long, wavy mane to help my ascent. Nothing was easier. In another moment I was cozily settled on his back, which felt deliciously comfortable, and the mane seemed to tuck itself round me like a fleecy rug. Shut your eyes, said my conductor or steed. I don't know which to call him. Go to sleep if you like. I'll wake you when we meet the others. Thank you, I said, feeling too content and comfortable to disagree with anything he said. Then came a feeling of being raised up, a breath of colder air, which seemed to grow warm again almost immediately, and I knew nothing more till I heard the words, There they are. I opened my eyes and looked about me. It was night. Overhead in the deep blue sky innumerable stars were sparkling, and down below at our feet I heard the lap, lap of rippling waves. A dark, half-shadowy figure stood at my right hand, and as I saw it more clearly I distinguished the form of the other lion. With, yes, there was someone sitting on his back. Hattie, I exclaimed. Yes, yes, Geraldine, it's me, my brother's own dear voice replied. We're going right over the sea, did you know? Isn't it splendid? We're going to see father and mamma. Hold out your hand so that you can feel mine. I did so and my fingers clasped his, and at that moment the brother lions rose into the air, and down below, ever fainter and fainter, came the murmur of the sea, while up above the twinkling stars looked down on what surely was one of the strangest sights they had ever seen in all their long, long existence. Then again I seemed to know nothing, though somehow, all through, I felt the clasp of Hattie's hand and knew we were close together a beautiful light streaming down upon us, of which I was conscious even through my closed eyelids, was the next thing I remember. It seemed warm as well as bright, and I felt as if basking in it. Wake up, Geraldine, said Hattie's voice. I opened my eyes, but now I have come to the part of my story which I have never been able, and never shall be able, to put into fitting words. The scene before me was too beautiful too magically exquisite for me even to succeed in giving the faintest idea of it. Still I must try, though knowing that I cannot but fail. Can you picture to yourself the loveliest day of all the perfect summer days you have ever known? No, more than that. A day like summer and spring in one, the richness of color, the balmy fragrance of the prime of the year joined to the freshness, the indescribable hopefulness and expectation which is the charm of the spring. The beauty and delight seemed made up of everything lovely mingled together. Sights, sounds, scents, feelings. There was the murmur of running streams, the singing of birds, the most delicious scent from the flowers growing in profusion and of every shade of color. Hattie and I looked at each other. We still held each other by the hand, but now, somehow, we were standing together on the grass, though I could not remember having got down from my perch on the lion's back. Where are the lions, Hattie? I said. Hattie seemed to understand everything better than I did. They're all right, he replied, resting a little. 
we've come a long way geraldine and so quick and where are we i asked what is this place hattie is it fairyland or or heaven hattie smiled it's not either he said you'll find out the name yourself but come we must be quick for we can't stay very long hold my hand tight and then we can run faster i seemed to know that something more beautiful than anything we had ever seen yet was coming i did not ask hattie any more questions though i had the feeling that he knew more than i did he seemed quite at home in this wonderful place quite able to guide me and his face was shining with happiness we ran a good way and very fast but i did not feel at all tired or breathless my feet seemed to have wings and all the time the garden around us grew lovelier and lovelier if hattie had not been holding my hand so fast i should scarcely have been able to resist stopping to gather some of the lovely flowers everywhere in such profusion or to stand still to listen to the dear little birds singing so exquisitely overhead it must be fairyland i repeated to myself more than once in spite of what hattie had said but suddenly all thought of fairyland or flowers birds and garden went out of my head as hattie stopped in his running geraldine he half whispered look there there was a little arbor a few yards from where we stood and there seated on a rustic bench her dear face all sunshine was mamma she started up as soon as she saw us and hastened forward her arms outstretched my darlings my darlings she said as hattie and i threw ourselves upon her she did look so pretty she was all in white and she had a rose one of the lovely roses i had been admiring as we ran fastened to the front of her dress mamma mamma i explained as i hugged her oh mamma i am so happy to be with you is this your garden mamma and may we stay with you always now wasn't it good of the lions to bring us i have been so unhappy mamma somebody said you would get ill far away but nobody could get ill here oh mamma you will let us stay always she did not speak but looking at hattie i saw a change in his face geraldine he said i told you we couldn't stay long the lions would be scolded if we did and you know you must say your french poetry and then there came over me the most agonizing feeling of disappointment and misery all the pent-up wretchedness of the last weeks at school woke up and overwhelmed me like waves of dark water it is as impossible for me to put this into words as it was for me to describe my exquisite happiness for no words ever succeeded in expressing the intense and extraordinary sensations of some dreams and of course as you will have found out by this time the strange adventures i have been relating were those of a dream though i still after all these years that have passed since then remember them so vividly it was the fatal words french poetry that seemed to wake me to bring back my terrible unhappiness exaggerated by the fact of my dreaming french poetry i gasped oh hattie how can you remind me of it hattie suddenly turned away and i saw the face of one of the lions looking over his shoulder with strange to say a white frilled cap surrounding it you must try to drink this my dear said the lion if the lion it was for as i stared at him the brown face changed into a rather ruddy one a round good-humoured face with pleasant eyes and smile reminding me of mamma's old nurse who had once come to see us i stared still more and sat up a little for wonderful to relate i was no longer in the lovely garden no longer even in the show-room leaning against the lion i was in bed in a strange room which i had never seen before and leaning over me was the owner of the frilled cap holding a glass in her hand try to drink this my dearie she said again and then i knew it was not the lion but this stranger who had already spoken to me i felt very tired and i sank back again upon the pillow what did it all mean where was i where had i been i asked myself this in a vague sleepy sort of way but i was too tired to say it aloud and before i could make up my mind to try i fell asleep again the room seemed lighter the next time i opened my eyes it was in fact nearly the middle of the day and a fine day as clear as ever it was in great mexington i felt much better and less tired now 
almost quite well except for a slight pain in my throat which told me i must have caught cold for my colds generally began in my throat i wonder if it was with riding so far in the night i first said to myself with the confused remembrance of my wonderful dream i didn't feel at all cold on the lion's back and in the garden it was loverly warm then as my waking senses quite returned i started it had been only a dream oh dear oh dear but still something had happened i was certainly not in my little bed in the corner of the room i shared with emma and harriet smith at greenbank where had my dream begun or was i still dreaming i raised myself a little very softly for now i began to remember the good-humoured face and the frilled cap and i thought to myself that unless its owner was a dream too perhaps she was still in the room and i wanted to look about me first on my own account what there was to see was very pleasant and very real i felt quite sure i was not dreaming now wherever i was it was a large old-fashioned room with red curtains at the two windows and handsome dark wood furniture there was a fire burning cheerfully in the grate and the windows looked very clean even though there was a prospect of chimney-tops to be seen out of the one nearest to me which told me i was still in a town and then i began to distinguish sounds outside though here in the room it was so still there were lots of wheels passing some going quickly some lumbering along with heavy slowness it was much noisier than at miss ledbury's or in my own old house here i seemed to be in the very heart of a town i began to recall the events of the day before more clearly yes up to the time i remembered leaning against the carved lion in mr cranston's show-room all had been real i felt certain i recollected with a little shiver the scene in the drawing-room at greenbank and how they had all refused to believe i was speaking the truth when i declared that the french poetry had entirely gone out of my head and then there was the making up my mind that i could bear school no longer and the secretly leaving the house and at last losing my way in the streets i had meant to go to mrs selwood's or at least to get her address and write to her but where was i now what should i do my head grew dizzy again with trying to think and a faint miserable feeling came over me and i burst into tears i did not cry loudly but there was some one watching in the room who would have heard even a fainter sound than that of my sobs some one sitting behind my bed curtains whom i had not seen who came forward now and leant over me saying in words and voice that seemed curiously familiar to me geraldine my poor little girl end of section ten taking refuge